We've just read together the record of Thomas, called Doubting <coughs> Thomas. When the Lord Jesus was risen, wouldn't believe unless he had the hard evidence in front of him. And as I can see him and see the print of the nails in his hand and the, the, the gash in his side. And so that wish for him was, was granted. He saw the Lord Jesus and he said, look, look at my hands. If you really need that evidence, put your hand into my side and believe. <clears throat> and it was said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So often in life we want the hard evidence. We want everything to be black and white, clear cut, to have the facts before our very eyes. And yet in this passage we see that to follow Christ to look to the Bible for answers requires something more than that. Requires more than having everything lined up. It requires belief. And in Hebrews chapter 11, a passage that many will know well, in verse 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. There are many things that we are required to believe for which we will not have the hard evidence. And that gap is made up by this idea of faith of trusting in things in the absence of that hard evidence. <coughs> That's a problem for life in the modern world, isn't it? We live in a world that is inherently cynical, that says if there are no facts, it did not happen. And we all, all of us, have that cynicism within us. It's necessary, isn't it, to live in the modern world where you're having so many people telling you so many different things. We, we've had all this, haven't we, with, with the debate on leaving the EU and, and one side telling you absolutely 100% facts. The world will fall apart if Britain leaves the EU. And the other side telling you absolute 100% facts that this is going to be a wonderful opportunity and, and, and Britain will blossom. And so we become cynical, don't we? We want to test everything that we're told. We won't believe anything unless we have the proof. Where is the proof? And as we read together in that, that passage in John, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And so when it comes to understanding Christ, understanding the gospel, we turn to the writings. These things are written that we may believe. Our proof is contained in in this book. Well, still we have a, a problem, don't we? Because people say, well, the Bible's a very big and complex book. How can I possibly take all that and understand what I'm supposed to believe? And there are people who come at me from different directions and, and tell me that the Bible says different things. I need someone I can rely on, someone I trust 
to tell me what the Bible says, to interpret that for me. Well, is that right? Is it right that we need another person, more knowledgeable than ourselves, to tell us what the Bible says? I want to turn to another Bible passage, and this is back in the Old Testament, in Psalm 94. Psalm 94 and verse 8. Understand, you senseless among the people, and you fools, when will you be wise? He who planted the ear, shall he not hear? He who formed the eye, shall he not see? He who instructs the nations, shall he not correct? He who teaches man knowledge. The Lord knows the thoughts of man, that they are futile. Blessed is the man whom you instruct, O Lord, and teach out of your law. Sometimes we carry on this whole conversation of of what should we believe? As if God has nothing to do with this world. As if he's not active and living. As if it's up to us human beings to sort this all out amongst ourselves. As if he isn't teaching us and telling us through his word what we should believe. It says the Lord knows the thoughts of man that they are futile. And that word futile means like vapour, like breath. You wake up in the morning and you, and you breathe on the mirror. And there's a a little mist and that disappears in an instant. That's what man's thoughts and ideas are like, just a vapour. Blessed is the man who you instruct, O Lord, and teach out of your law. So do we need somebody else to tell us what this says? Or should we turn to these pages ourselves? To seek wisdom. To listen to what God has to say. I want to turn to another passage that we we quote often. And it's in the second letter of Timothy. To Timothy I should say. Second letter to Timothy chapter 3. So 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now the actual Greek there... Is God breathed. All scripture is God breathed. What does that mean? Does it mean that it's as God breathed, as he spoke? Well, we do believe the Bible is the word of God. But I want to add another element there. I want to take you back to the creation of all things. And I want to take you back to the formation of Adam out of the clay. And God made Adam out of the clay and then there was this lifeless being. And what did God do then? He breathed the breath of life into this lifeless being and it became no longer just a figure formed out of the clay but a living, breathing being. And we're told that scripture is God-breathed. It's living. 
It's active. It can do things. It is the word of God. It is powerful. More so than any other work that man might create. Any other words, which would just be dead words on a page, no matter how beautiful they are. Let us just turn back to Hebrews. So, turn forward to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews 4, verse 12. (coughs) For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This is more than a book. It is filled with the life-giving breath of God. It is the living word. Our words, anything we can create, is but vapour. But a mist compared to the mighty wind of the word of God. This book can be a storm. It can be powerful. It could drive ships across the ocean. Imagine a great sea vessel and how many people just blowing out of their own mind would it take to move that ship. But the power of God can drive it all the way across the ocean. There are a great many people who are willing to give us their words so that we can understand these words. There's a great academic endeavour, isn't there? Great minds and bodies of writing. People undertaking careful analysis and building great libraries. People undertaking doctoral theses and writing learned articles. Is the academic process the right way to find knowledge and understanding of this word of God? I just want to think about that for a bit. To help with context, the Bible is about 800,000 words long. Now, if someone wants to become an academic, they have to do a doctorate. Um, And a thesis is going to be about 50 to 200 words long, a thousand words long. If only it was 50 to 200 words long. 50 to 200,000 words long. And those are numbers that are ingrained on my brain. And they have to sit on top of of the body of knowledge that has gone before. You have to reference it, say, what does so-and-so taught and -and so-and-so said? But it has to add to it. It has to say something new. Otherwise, it's not worthy of a doctorate. You can't be a doctor if you say, so-and-so was right. means nothing. You have to add to the body of knowledge. And as a PhD student, that's your biggest fear. I remember this very well. I mean, I'm a physical scientist, so nothing to do with, with scripture or anything. But as you're doing your work, your worry is that somebody else will do exactly what you're doing and publish before you, and, and you'll have to think of something new. Now, I think there's about 200 theology departments in the world. Each one might produce 10 PhD students a year. So, 100,000 words each, that's 200 million words being created each year. And if only a quarter of those are on Bible studies, that's about 50 million words. All of whom have to say something new, something novel. And if you had articles as well, that's maybe another 10 million new words being created every year about the Bible, all have to say something new. So the number of words written about the Bible each year exceed the actual words of the Bible by a factor of about 80 per year. 
And that's gone on for over a thousand years. How much body of academia is there about the Bible that is extra to the Bible? And each one of those has to say something new. Otherwise, it's not a doctorate, it's not an article that could be published in an academic journal. That's a lot of human ideas and understanding. The world has gained a lot from academic endeavour. But is it the right way to understand this book? One example, people might say, well, we can analyse the Bible as if it were any other book. We can use historical techniques that have been established. And actually, when I do that, I discover that, well, the Bible is just any other book. Is that right? If you analyse the Bible as if it were any other book, you might conclude that it was just like any other book. Well, that's strange, because somebody else might choose to look at the Bible as if it were the living and perfect word of God and conclude that it is the living and perfect word of God. Unfortunately, there's a trap, isn't there, that in any academic endeavour, you have to be clear about your starting assumptions. If I start off doing some analysis and assume something... At the end of the work, all I may find is my assumptions staring back at me. The Bible is not just any other book. Therefore, it cannot be analysed as any other book. Just a, a passage to read in Jeremiah in chapter 8. Jeremiah 8 and verse 9. The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom do they have? That's an interesting principle, isn't it? Their wise men had said, actually, we can go beyond the word of the Lord. We can come up with our own ideas. So it says, so they weren't all that wise, were they? They've shown their lack of wisdom by their judgments. So who is the intended audience for the Bible? Who did Jesus go to when he went to preach? Did he go to the, the academics? Did he go to argue? On a point of law, he could have done. When he was 12 years old, he went to the temple and he astounded the teachers by his questions and his answers. If he had wanted to promote his ideas and his teachings through the academic route, he could have done so. But he didn't. He spoke to fishers and farmers and traders. He gave a simple message to simple people. It wasn't glamorous. It wasn't clever. His word was hard because it required people to examine themselves and to change. I want to turn to the first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 1. Corinthians 1 verse 17 For Christ did not send me to baptise but to preach the gospel not with wisdom of words lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved it is the power of God the teaching of the Bible is foolishness to those who don't want to hear it 
to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Down to verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised. God has chosen. And so those who want to show the word of God have to be willing to be foolish. And weak and base and despised. Because most people will look on these things and they won't go, oh, yeah, that's really good. They will look and say, how can you say that you base your belief on, the, on this ancient book and sort of all the things that we're used to hearing? Those who follow Christ are told that that will be the reaction. And it says, those who can't cope with that. Those who say, well, actually, I want to try and, and look wise and smart and mighty and all those things. He says, that's going to be a stumbling block for you. Because not many like that are called. If we just turn over a page to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're given a solution. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. We have to give up the, the trappings of, of wisdom and just look like little children who are willing to, to follow the teachings of the Lord God in order that we may build up true wisdom. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Therefore, let no one boast in men. For all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world of life or death or things present or things to come. All are yours. See, it's not about people. And of course, where there's man's teaching, it all ends up being about the people. It's the teaching, the writings of Professor so-and-so or Dr. so-and-so. Well, that chap there, he really knows what he's talking about. I really listen to them. It's not about that. All things are yours. This book comes to all men, all women, equally. We all have that right to read it, to be changed by it, to have a hope in it. All things are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God's. We shouldn't let anyone stand between us and God. We don't say, well, I will follow so-and-so and they will tell me what God wants me to do. We have a responsibility to hear the word of the Lord God for ourselves in reading it, in seeking to understand it. The Bible tells us we have only one mediator between us and God, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And sometimes people struggle because they say, well, Actually, that person who's trying to teach me what the Bible says, I don't like the way they go about things. And that's a stumbling block for them. It's not about that person. It's about the word of God. If we turn back to what we read before in Hebrews chapter 4. As we read before, 
Hebrews 4 verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It is not for us to divide up the word of God and slice and dice it and say, that's a good bit, that's a terrible bit. The reverse is true. It cuts us in two. It lays us bare. It tells us the truth about ourselves. That isn't to say there aren't difficult passages and things we need to think about. Things that we need to discuss with other people. But the answers aren't in somebody else's complicated theory. The answers are in here. The things that really matter are explained in the Bible over and over and over again so that it is clear for us. So what is at the heart of belief? Belief, I suggest, is not an intellectual exercise. There are proofs, and you will hear many in these talks. But at some point, we have to take a leap of faith. We have to let these words of life blow through us. Change us by reading, considering, by putting these things into action. And if we do take that leap of faith, then no other book has the power to tell us about ourselves and to change us and to offer us a wonderful hope and to bring us to God. Because no other book is the living and powerful word of God.